Wow. <laughs> yeah, we are also happy about it. Good evening, everybody. Or like, yeah, it's midday <laughs> for you, Zachary. <laughs> It's 12 noon in Los Angeles. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so um, we would just start with a few um, organizational things um, and Lulu. <laughs> yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm really happy about this evening and looking forward to the talk. Um, yeah, just for you to know that uh, we muted you um, now for the talk just to get as little distraction as possible. Um, but you can always um, post your questions in the public chat and later on we will um, discuss them. Yeah, but just um, please type them in. And then um, also we are recording the whole talk. So if you don't want to be seen, um, switch off the camera, but most of you did that already. Um, yeah, looking forward to, to that now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Lulu. <laughs> yeah, welcome, Zachary. <laughs> it's a, thank it's you. a, it's a real pleasure, and um, yeah, we feel very honored that you um, make the time to speak to us. <laughs> it's my uh, pleasure. For everybody who, uh, yeah, just knows your name, it's important to um, state the fact that you are, yeah, you're an independent artist, a cultural producer, and a trans woman who has performed and exhibited her work internationally in museums, a lot of festivals, um, including the Whitney Biennial at the Hamel Museum in Los Angeles, yeah, and many more. And what is also interesting about your journey is that you, um, yeah, you're also a, a producer for a docu-series uh, called This Is Me. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you were also um, involved as a producer on the Golden Globe and Emmy-winning TV show Transparent. And absolutely. usually, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and I would like to start with some um, warm up questions. You are very experienced in giving talks, yes. but maybe just to get in the mood. <laughs> you got it. Okay. Um, it's uh, driving or walking? Well, I live in Los Angeles, so driving, but I like walking. I prefer, I like to walk around. I walk around my neighborhood every day. Uh, New York or Los Angeles? Ooh, tough. I was born in Syracuse, New York. I lived in New York City straight out of high school. I actually moved to the city the day after I graduated high school <laughs> and um, still spend so much time in New York, truly. So, but I live here. I live, I chose to live here. I prefer living here. So, I'll have to say Los Angeles. Okay. <laughs> film, film or book? Oh, well, as you see, yes. I'm a voracious reader. <laughs> um, film, oh, I couldn't choose either. Between That's those fine. Because <laughs> I'm such a cinephile. I truly have always just, uh, you know, film has always been my outlet and as a young person especially it was the only way that I knew that there was a world outside of the rust belt town that I grew up in you know <laughs> yeah listening or speaking listening <laughs> definitely definitely I love listening I surround myself with big characters and <laughs> um, I can be a performer, I'm a natural performer, but truly I love absorbing, experiencing, listening, um, and understanding other people to, to know myself better through them. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and I would like we would like to start with a project um, which is sort of in the past, but I think it has still a lot of importance, at least um, for also a lot of people who are especially interested in photography. Yeah, and it's the series relationship. I will. I'm gonna um, share my screen <laughs> because okay. we put together a few images. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Oh, thank you for doing this. 
Um, so relationship was a, a series of work, uh, a series of photographs that I created with my then partner, Reese Ernst, who was transitioning to, you know, be a masculine bodied person. Um, and I, as I was transitioning to become a feminine person. And so we were transitioning simultaneously side by side. And I had a background in photography. I had already completed my MFA from CalArts where I think, you know, it's a very rigorous kind of academic theoretical training that you get. Um, and in some ways it drained the, the joy and the spontaneity of image making. And my way back to discovering the kind of magical um, medium of photography was, was with this series in 2008. So I had just finished grad school, or I guess I finished in 2007 and then 2008. Um, both of these photos are actually from 2008. Of course, the series continued um, for the duration of our relationship, we split up in 2014. This is my closet dressing room. <laughs> I still have a, a few of these elements on my shrine. It's funny to see them here so many years ago. Yeah. Um, this was in Silver Lake. It was a funny synchronicity that we both lived in apartment 206, <laughs> different buildings, of course, um, not far away from each other. And uh, yeah, the previous photo actually was also taken in this closet, um, different angle. So it was a, an incredible discovery um, having navigated relationships with cisgender men for so many years of uh, uh, my young adulthood and my adolescence to kind of find the freedom, the liberation of being in a relationship with another trans person. Um, it really provided an expansive space for us to create ourselves. Um, to see ourselves outside of the constraints of other people's expectations. Um, we change everything we touch and everything we touch changes us. It's an Octavia Butler quote from <laughs> the parable of the sower, um, but it's true. And in our relationships, um, we're really programming each other in a way like we're learning um, the universe of another person and I found just a, a truly liberating space um, in, in it being in a relationship with another trans person so we photographed in the kind of that space of, of freedom and self-invention and um, did not intend really for it to be a public work of art until years had passed. And I was um, doing a studio visit with Stuart Comer, who was uh, curating the Whitney Biennial that year. 2014. I think at the time he was still at the Tate Modern and was making a transition back to the US. And um, on a whim, <laughs> I printed out these photos. It had become at that point an, you know, an, ex an extensive archive uh, of five years of our lives. Mm -hmm. And it was really in the quantity of image mm -hmm. of images that it became a series. And we realized like, oh, this is an art project. It was completely 
incidental, truly. Um, Reese is a filmmaker and also has always had the impulse of documenting um, his life in a diaristic way. So it was really a perfect confluence and uh, collaboration of, of the life that we were living together. Well, I remember when I saw those images the first time I was, yeah, I was amazed also by this playfulness between sort of staging or like being very playful yeah. And then also about this incredible intimacy you created together in those images. And um, yeah, maybe we're going to speak about intimacy later on also for the work uh, re regarding the work uh, we are showing at Photo Museum. Yeah. But there is also something really interesting in, in terms of artistic, like you were saying, like contextualizing, because on one hand, there was there is the series of um, images snapshots you you also call them snapshots yeah and then there is this incredible semi-autobiographical film she gone rogue yes <laughs> <laughs> absolutely and i think of she gone rogue as like a masterpiece yes <laughs> i remember one time reese told me it was like you shouldn't say that to people and i was like why not i think it's a masterpiece <laughs> and i stick by it um and I guess before we talk about She Gone Rogue, I mean, just I'll also say about these images that it was pre social media, you know, like, and so we weren't, we never felt compelled to put these out there in the world. Um, and therefore, they truly are a very personal archive of images and I think the intimacy that you're speaking to is a, is a result of us having the, the, the privacy of, of creating this work and you know it was certainly the Whitney Biennial as an opportunity but it was also this mission to put images out into the world that we had not seen before. And we had this tremendous feeling when we got together that we didn't know if trans people had ever been in relationships together before because there was practically no evidence of such. And there was a few rare examples. One was Southern Comfort, a, a documentary um, that we watched maybe halfway into our relationship, but certainly in the history of images, there was practically nothing. And it was uh, a bit of a social justice mission to put these out there um, and to be the, the change that we wish to see in the world, which is a world in which trans people are able to love each other and holistic and organic ways. Um, and then She Gone Rogue was an extension of that. And of course, um, images are these silent moments mm -hmm. um, that are these fleeting you know, and fleeting moments. And She Gone Rogue is a, a full world. Um, so Reese had witnessed my relationships with elders over those years with Holly Woodlawn, Flawless Sabrina, and Vaginal Davis. Mm -hmm. And it was a revelation, I think, for him to have these uh, <laughs> huge characters mm -hmm. in, in, you know, and who were a big part of my life. Um, and Flawless and Holly, a blessed memory, are, are no longer alive. Um, so I'm so grateful for, for the film as a kind of, uh, as documentation of these beautiful relationships. And uh, Reese as a filmmaker um, really, I think, think pushed me as an artist to expand into new uh, genres and uh, She Gone Rogue is a 25 minute um, 
opus that's a, it's a heroine's journey mm-hmm. i am kind of moving through worlds um and ultimately pondering existence itself and uh the the you know looking at the possibility of living a sustainable life into old age and then thinking about um what happens after that Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) because my character kind of disappears into a different world yeah so it's a very very much um a symbolic journey yeah and it hasn't i mean i think it hasn't lost its uh yeah, it's, it's power at all. I mean, sometimes with artworks um, or especially series of photographs who were sort of created during that time, um, yeah. often they feel a bit, they feel aged. And that's, I, I, I think, not the case, um, both not with the, with, the, with the images and also not with the film. Thank you. <laughs> I always try to create work for the future. I mean, yeah. that's my kind of... Uh, framework for creating is like how do you distill things in a way that reaches the broadest audience Mm -hmm. you know the most people like how can you distill things to universal themes that people relate to and how can you do that in a way that's timeless Mm -hmm. and that perhaps peaks around the corner to see into the future and so often we're just mired in the minutia of life and our noses are up against the wall in any given moment. And it's only with time and space um, that we're able to understand things in their full complexity. So I try to zoom out as much as I can to speak to people through time, you know, speak to people on all the timelines. And maybe, maybe you can talk a little bit about um, maybe photography or like, let's say, working with images as a strategy, because I, yeah, that you, you, you were in conversation with uh, Rosalind and um, yeah. yeah, it was hosted by the Baltimore Museum. And at some point in this conversation, you say uh, photography is a possibility to fall in love. Yes, <laughs> and it's, I was like, at first, I was like, this is like, this is, oh God, this is so <laughs> corny. <laughs> but, but regarding your approach, I, I think I can grasp um, what you mean by saying that. But obviously, it's also, it's like, like you were saying, it's um, maybe time traveling into the future for you. But it's also, I mean, it's also activism. It's very important messages mm-hmm. you are carrying out to the world. And can you talk a little bit about image making and the process you are interested in regarding like creating a piece of art and also who has a, the potential to be actually very functioning as, a, as an activist tool? Oh my goodness. There's so many directions I can go with this question, but I do think that love and art are our noblest pursuits as humans and that our greatest um, and most tangible offering is to create things that have never existed before. Um, And I think love is the place where most people are able to do that um, in their lives and that to really resonate with the person that you're photographing, I, it's a, I, I do really experience and absorb people. Um, and I think that the best photographers have done that. Um, the photographers who are really able to reach people's humanity. And I have, you know, six years of education as a photographer. So it's a very deep rooted relationship and the history of power through the lens, the history of authorship, um, of subjects, of subjugation, of imperialization, of colonization, 
all of these um, these threads that are present in humanity and in are, photography <laughs> and are so intertwined in the camera and the machine and the industrial era and all of the systems of, of power and control. And so to be an author and a subject simultaneously in a body that um, um, my boyfriend's interrupting me. So <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but I think to be the author and the subject is a new position to be in. Um, and I did not see that as a student. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I guess in, in certain ways, but certainly not with transgender people or with, uh, or with gender expansive people. I mean, you see it in um, Lyle Ashton Harris or Yasuma Samora Mura. You, you see gender play Claude Cahan, who I found at a young age. Um, you know, there are these kind of traces, these ephemeral traces of our existence. Um, but so much that's not documented. And in my relationships with elders, I was always shocked um, to find that so much history was only an oral history, that mm -hmm. so much of our history is, is not recorded. So the personal is political. The, the feminist slogan of 50 years ago, I think is, is so true, is more true now than ever. And that to understand a person's story, um, th that to create empathy in the world, it's, it's, you can't hate up close. And when you know somebody's story, and you identify with them. And that can be a very subtle thing. That can be a glimpse into a person's life in a photograph that can be, you know, uh, a few minutes even of a video or film. Um, that is our best chance at equality, um, is telling our stories and reaching the maximum amount of people. Mm -hmm. And I think that right now, um, there are so many pressing and urgent um, existential threats for all of us, you know? It's just crucial that we empathize with each other and find new ways of empathizing. And I think that image making and film and video are... Uh, the best, best paths forward for that. And maybe um, something you said, I, I find also really interesting is the fact that so many stories have, I mean, there have been stories documented, sort mm -hmm. of portraying maybe uh, trans people or gender non-conforming people. Yeah. But yeah. usually it was, all, or most of the time there is a problematic regarding um, the agency. And I think that that's something you also with, with the project with Rosalind is, um, yeah, it's very apparent that it's a different way of um, collaborating. Yeah. And it has nothing to do with looking um, in from the outside for a very short amount of time. It's, it functions differently. The image making process functions differently yeah and maybe that's yeah that's what we can feel as a viewer um yeah later on. it's such a different perspective <laughs> and i don't condemn the more objective authors of images either because i think that there's advantages to both mm -hmm. in certain ways i mean i think that if you're an objective outsider witnessing a community you notice things that perhaps are so embedded and naturalized into mm -hmm. a person who's inside the experience that they might not notice. Mm -hmm. But then of course, if you're an insider, you just have a level of access mm -hmm. to things that outsiders never do. There's a kind of fluency um, to, 
just shared lived experience mm -hmm. that really is impossible to simulate. Yeah. But um, I'm I'm so thankful for all of the images of you know because they do tell us so much about where we're coming from, and oftentimes those power dynamics are embedded mm -hmm. in the frame and that too tells us um the story, where, the story. Wherever, yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> um so i don't know i'm i am i have been in this life this trans life for a long time <laughs> and um I'm not easily shaken or triggered or anything. Like I tend to be a, a lot like the, the elder generations, I think, and in terms of having seen things and having experienced things that are beyond the pale to today's standards. But of course today things are better and worse at the same time because now trans people are really on the radar and are, um at the center of a cultural debate and a culture war in which you know our identities our access to health care yeah. um our basic human rights are being contested not only in the court of public opinion but in actual courts from state to state around the country i just wanted to say like i came across news from a couple of days ago about i think it's a legislation where um where parents can actually be sued if they agree um to certain medications if yep. they have a young person living with them or where they are responsible for um and it's actually a, an act a criminalized act um so it's also very like a very actual political yeah. threat which i was not aware that it's actually it's actually happening right now it's pretty hot. It's a pretty hot time. Yeah, definitely. And but would you maybe can you because you say it's it's better and it's worse. Mm -hmm. Would you say that regarding sort of artistic expressions and also um, the variety of voices being heard or being more present? Would you say that this is generally like substantially better than yes. in comparison to maybe 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah. because... I think that's the part that's better without <laughs> a doubt. That mm -hmm. is absolutely the part that's better. And art is the silver lining of an era like this, for mm -hmm. sure. Um, because people are much more in touch with their humanity. And um, I think the, the fundamental kind of quandaries of life and existence in a way that maybe pre 2020, we were much more distracted and we're still distracted, but I think increasingly selective mm -hmm. about how we spend our time, which is why it's such a gift that, you know, folks are here right now, <laughs> witnessing this conversation we're yeah. having. Yeah. It's an honor. And then- oh, it's Also, I admire your very generous perspective also on the more, um, sort of yeah photographic voices which are not so concerned about um oh, yeah absolutely. which are more concerned about objectivity than something else i think it's a yeah it's very it's a very generous approach i'm also sometimes yeah. i think we are very critical at photo museum <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah i, appreciate I mean do you want to talk about do you want to talk about dion arbus for a moment yes of course i mean i just love Dan Arbus. I mean, and I think that um, having read biographies <laughs> about her, knowing about her work, having known and met some of her subjects, I think truly um, there's a lot lost in this moment of identity politics when we're really trying to parse things out because ultimately everybody feels to some extent in some area of their life like an outsider. Mm -hmm. And at the time, nobody wanted to talk to the people that she was photographing, let alone photograph them, mm -hmm. let alone look at the photographs. I mean, she was venturing into communities that were clandestine and taboo 
And um, I think that there's a heroic element to that. <laughs> I'm so happy that those images exist at all, you know? And truly, she did reach people. She clearly did. Um, yeah. She, she so, had a big impact. Yeah. And the um, empowerment of being represented, of being remembered, um, of being eternal. It's, I think, for a long time, it was overstated the disempowerment, the disenfranchisement, the exploitation. Um, and I hope that we move into a future where complexity is embraced mm -hmm. we're not there right now this is a very like polarized especially in the u.s it feels like a very polarized time with not a lot of nuance um but i think ultimately yeah people are afraid to say the wrong thing right now and they should not we should, nobody should be afraid of saying the wrong thing like we should all be um engaging in open conversations with each other even when they're challenging mm -hmm. even when we disagree and um without that we lose our connection to the collective conscious that's a very strong statement <laughs> yeah and in terms of Rosalind, these are photographs of her. So she um, is a legend in, yeah. in the community for me in Los Angeles. Um, she is so emblematic of, of surviving trans life in the 20th century. And that like so many, you know, queer and trans people um, was not really welcome in her home as a teenager and sought refuge in the city, which meant working the streets of Times Square as a sex worker and finding her way to drugs in the 1970s. Um, and she wrote a book about it called Branded Tea, which is a true snapshot of the difficulties of that life, the scars that one um, moves forward into the world with. She, she and, says at some point, I thought that's what it's really fitting to what you were just saying. She says, my spirit and soul seem to be uplifted and smashed on a daily basis. Yeah. Yeah. This stuck with, with me. Yeah. Definitely. How, how did you, I mean, I understand the concept of uh, of icon, but how did you how did you meet her? Like, how did you develop a relationship <laughs> with her? Um, because yeah, again, here also the images are very yeah, they're very tender and they're very powerful. Also with all those references to art history and but how did you meet her? How did you uh, become <laughs> so close that she was actually um, yeah willing to also collaborate on the images with you? We met doing, you know, in the community. So I first probably saw her. Um, she's very involved still as an activist in the community. She's a mentor for um, uh, the Trans Latina Coalition. Um, she's just kind of an, an icon. So it was inevitable in just navigating LA, LA trans life, that I would run into her eventually. And I met her finally at a friend's house. Um, and it was like a big party. There was like 50 people there. And I remember just like zeroing in on her and just being like, who is this incredible person? Because she has a very um, hypnotic effect. Um, and She's a Taurus, like me, and she's Jewish, like me. So we have these things in common that made it very um, easy to, yeah, we kind of, you know, you have kismet with some people. It's like, you just uh, spark. And she and I 
I think identify with each other in a lot of ways. And it's through these relationships that I learned so much about survival and about uh, the history that I'm a part of. Mm -hmm. Maybe to to take one little step back, because I also know or I read that um, Relationship, the series we talked previously about, was also sort of compared to Nan Goldin. And what is really interesting about the period Nan Goldin started to take photographs was also yeah, marked yeah. or sort of like really stained by, by the pandemic called AIDS. And that's yeah. also something Rosalind was incredibly active with in this um, center, the Lesbian and Gay Community Service Center. Yeah. And can you maybe talk a little bit about this uh, work she did? Because yeah, it's um, something we keep, at least I think my generation keeps forgetting mm. that there was a pandemic who robbed a, an entire generation of their communities and their friends and family members. Yeah, absolutely. And that work, I know she really started in the 70s. Um, I think from Golden, I've learned and relationship shares this that like your and certainly the elders in my life taught me that the life you live can be your art form. Mm -hmm. And with the, the fairy godmothers in my life, none of them ever had the means to represent themselves or to create things um, because they were so busy trying to survive. Mm -hmm. um, and I think many of them would have been artists today, you know, and I, tr you know, truly um, am standing on their shoulders. Like the access that I have to the tools of cultural production are because of their um, incredible sacrifices mm -hmm. and labor um, and, I think people often ask me like who my favorite artists are <laughs> and I'll name them, you know, Flawless Sabrina, Hollywood Lawn, Alexis Del Lago, none of whom made objects or things, but the lives that they lived were their medium, you know, the ways that they created personas and then navigated publicity and navigated um, their communities. Um, Nan Golden is a very, I think, cogent rapper, you know, example of that too. Like her photographs, you know, famously are flawed. They're blurry. They're out of focus. The composition is sometimes <laughs> wacky. Yeah. Um, but it was like the life that she was living that was captivating to people. It was like the stories that she um, was witnessing. And uh, she's absolutely an inspiration. And for having, um, I think, uh, also a, a survival instinct, you know, to photograph communities on the edge of extinction. Um, yeah. And I think you make a great point about uh, the pandemics that humans have survived in recent memory and the fact that there is a generation um, still alive today who witnessed and persevered a pandemic. And we have a lot to learn from those people. Can, can you, I'm just gonna show like, yeah, this is- It looks fabulous, the show, congratulations. <laughs> yeah, no, we, yeah, we are, we are, yeah, we are happy with it. And you're like, uh, yeah, you're like opposite Collier Shore. Yes. There's Carmen Winnant. Um, mm -hmm. Collier Shore <laughs> taught at the School of Visual Arts, which is where I got my undergrad. Oh, really? And, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Back in, this is 2001 to 2005. We printed in the dark room together all the time. And I remember, I didn't ever take her class, but I was always 
looking over her shoulder to see what she was printing as we were. <laughs> so it's an honor to be, you know, exhibited alongside I her and, and then to have been photographed by her. And, you know, at this point, she photographed me once. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And these are um, photographs from Rosalind's archive from the 70s and 80s. Some of them were taken at, uh, oh God, it was called the Grape. Oh, I'm going to forget it right now because I'm on the spot, but it was a bar in Times Square, uh, the Gilded Grape. So if you look in like uh, trans periodicals from this era, you often see party photos from the Gilded Grape. And this one photo that's of Rosalind in a black top with three women mm -hmm. always makes her very emotional because all three. This one? Yeah, all three of the other women are deceased. And I think she struggles with survivor's guilt, you know, sometimes wow. feeling like she's one of so few mm -hmm. of her uh, sisters that is still alive. And how did you work together on those images? Like, how can I, like, because also something we read when we, when we talk a little bit deeper is that you were also saying at some point, it's sort of ongoing. It's not finished, right? Yeah, we continue to photograph, yeah. actually. <laughs> um, and, oh, Rosalind's just so iconic. Her look is so iconic. And she loves being photographed she loves the attention and she's very much an exhibitionist so it's really just a joy every time um, to create images with her we always laugh a lot and um it was truly just an excuse for me to hang out with her more often making these images and I mean, they're also like the first image, the 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 reddish with the reddish tone. For mm -hmm. me, it's also I don't know. For me, it's also uh, an image of resilience. It's someone who is, like you were saying, who was sort of uh, forced to go through incredibly difficult times, and she was still standing her ground. Yeah. But then the the one with the yeah with the with the Venus with the Botticelli mm -hmm. reference. Yeah. It's also yeah. It's also it there is a certain amount of humor mm -hmm. and I, I was wondering is it uh, are the images um uh, photographed in in her home or in in a surrounding she felt specially comfortable or yeah where did you take those images that's in her home yeah actually all three of them are mm -hmm. all three of these images are in her home and the middle image is um uh, her balcony, which looks out onto the Hollywood Dell, mm -hmm. which is the neighborhood that she's in. She's lived there, I think, for over 20 years. Um, but yeah, the Venus statue is in her, <laughs> in her living room. It's just, yeah, she's very quirky. She's just a really fun, um, quirky person. <laughs> We we and, are sure. And I think Sorry. that was her. I think that was her idea too. I think she was like, "I want to be Venus." <laughs> and... Yeah, no, it's it's amazing. Also with the with the gaze, um, toward, like outside the window, which is kind of like, you know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. This also this kind of visionary outlook. <laughs> And we are showing this work, um, like you said, alongside other artists, for example, like uh, uh, Carmen Winnant or Collier Shore. And um, yeah, it's sort of, it's an, I, I keep saying it's an interesting translation we were doing or Tilda Swinton was doing. It's basically from the, the, the novel by Virginia Woolf, um, yeah. and then the film by Sally Potter. And yeah, like we did some Obviously, we did some Instagram stalking, um, and you said <laughs> something really, really in, in, impressive um, when there was the opening in New York at Aperture, and you said that you um, saw Tilda in Orlando as a ten-year-old. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. 
and that you and your mom rented it at the local video store which i think is yeah, it's incredible i cannot even <laughs> imagine that we all went to actually rent <laughs> vhs tapes i know but you were also saying a bit like also like it's interesting because Micheline Thomas says something um, similar. She's also part of the show yeah. that it was the first time that you saw a boy character transform into into a woman and that you saw it around 100 times throughout your adolescence. And your yes. Years. <laughs> oh, my God. I loved it. I was obsessed with it. And does it still because, you know, we had a conversation also with a film a specialist after the opening and we were um, she's a. She's a queer author, um, a, a real, also a real literature person. And we were talking about how the film aged. And yeah, maybe that's something I really love about the show because it's so many like really current voices and it's also a very political show in our opinion. But how do you feel now um, about the film Orlando? Oh, do you think it's... it lost its, its spark no. for you or no? No. Oh, absolutely not. I mean, it's so epic. It's such a grand showcase of like through the centuries. So in terms of, you know, historical fiction, it's, it's an incredible work of art. And I haven't seen it recently, truly. So it's hard. Um, but it's almost as if I don't need to see it again. Like I, it's so... Uh, entrenched in my memory it's like in my brain like I, I can just you know remember like particular woven, moments it's yeah your thoughts in a sense yeah and it's fat I mean it's true just listening to you um recount that I I watched it over and over again throughout my childhood it was one of the few films that I really returned to over and over again because truly it's every like trans girl's dream that you just wake up a one <laughs> a beautiful desirable woman one morning um and I give all the credit in the world to Virginia Woolf for being a visionary for seeing that narrative um I think in terms of artists who are able to see through time it's just a great example of that and then Sally Potter and Tilda Swinton for you know, I mean, it was career defining for both of them yeah. and it really put them on the map. And so it's sort of, I think, uh, um, is a testament to the transcendent power of gender liberation. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not a trans, I mean, it, it's not really a trans story, but it's a story of transcending the limits and the confines mm -hmm. of, of patriarchy yeah and the idea of binarity no in a sense absolutely yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it's uh, be, um before we maybe have some questions from the audience i would i would like to ask you um a question which is always really important to me because i know obviously um yeah rosaline is uh, still ongoing but um you are working on new projects and it sounds maybe a bit odd, but is there something you look forward into the near or near future in your practice you can talk about right now? I know sometimes it's not yeah. possible. Can you share something you're excited? Oh, of course. I'm working, I'm working currently on two projects that will come out this year or next year. I've been doing lots of film and television work. Um, and last year I had the opportunity to co-direct The Lady in the Dale on HBO, which is about an uh, entrepreneur in the 1970s who had an energy-efficient three-wheeled car of the future um, before she was um, unceremoniously outed uh, as a felon on the run. Um, <laughs> and it's a really wild caper of a story. Um, and the next two projects I've, I've been working on for a year already. It's so interesting working in film and television because it's like a very intensive, you know, you just have tunnel, tunnel vision mm -hmm. on these stories and figuring out how to tell them exactly right 
And they're both really unprecedented stories and portraits of trans life. One focuses on just a trans every woman um, who has a, a, a moment in her past of, of big publicity and media attention and then disappeared. And it's an examination of all of the things that led to her disappearing. Mm -hmm. um, and the other story focuses specifically on, um, and it's a story that I'm telling uh, in collaboration. I work so often collaboratively and it focuses on the stories of sex workers, trans women who are sex workers, which I think is one of um, the un, unexplored mm -hmm. elements that is all pervasive and ubiquitous to trans life is, is sex work. And it's this thing that's been, I think, sidestepped and maneuvered around mm -hmm. in talking about trans life um, in the service of, of making our lives seem more respectable. Um, but it's ultimately been a disservice, I think, because sex work is, is a big part of uh, the history of trans people and is still a big part of our present. So that's what I'm doing now. Um, yeah, it's always really yeah. <laughs> I'm always photographing. I always take pictures. Um, I do it more slowly now, <laughs> and truly for my own joy and pleasure. You know, like I, I appreciate that. I uh, do not rely on like doing commercial work for, you know, um, and photography is the thing that I, the medium that I always return to and I always will. Yeah, that's, that's good to know. Yeah. But I can also imagine that it must be incredibly interesting to also work in like with moving images and telling stories because it's, yeah, the pace is different, both in creating, I guess, and then also in like reaching like also wider audiences, what you were saying um, in the very beginning. Absolutely. It's a moving, living, breathing photograph, essentially. I mean, it gives you a whole other dimensions of telling the story. Yeah. Yeah, it's more, more space for complexity, maybe at times. Yeah. Absolutely. Do we have any questions you think? Yes. <laughs> I'm just checking. <laughs> yes, I am uh, augmenting my eyebrows with the tools yes. of Zoom. <laughs> for anyone who didn't want to yeah. ask. <laughs> for, they, ha they do have a life of their own, ready? Yes. <laughs> and the lipstick too yeah i'm so jealous about the lipstick <laughs> no that there, there are like right now there are no questions um I are there think any questions that, that we didn't get to that you wanted to yes ask? exactly maybe let's just see if there's someone yeah it's it's uh, switzerland it's um sometimes i mean maybe there are some international listeners as well but sometimes uh yeah people take some time to ask questions but <laughs> uh yeah there is one question i i would like to ask maybe um because it's something which is also very uh crucial to photography and something i know is uh obviously also a huge topic in film and especially also in uh, series make in, in the making of series or creating uh, of series. And this is sort of the, the way if you work with people you don't know, and um, there's a lot of uh, sort of interaction and there's a lot of intimacy. And uh, yeah, did you did you work with on, on any of the shows you've been involved with? Um, how did it change regarding the sort of intimacy coaches? I don't know if I'm taking, if I'm saying that word correctly, 
Um, I know it wasn't a topic for a very long time um, in the film industry. Uh -huh. um, and I know it's not um, in, in film, in photography, but I know that it became a topic also after me too. And do you have experiences um, working with people who are sort of specialized in creating intimacy for the screen? Oh, what an interesting question. I mean, I, I love working collaboratively and film and television is uh, the collaboration uh, multiplies in so many directions. Like there's so many people that you collaborate with to, to create something that's on a larger scale. And um, as long as everybody is supported to do their best work, which includes, I think, you know, especially actors. The actors are the tip of the iceberg. It's like the thing that you see. Um, but underneath that, of course, is a whole structure to support mm -hmm. them. And I have friends who are intimacy coaches. I've worked on sets with them. Um, I'm just, yeah, I mean, there's so many horror stories about what, uh, you know, just different variations of sexual violence or sexual assault happen on set. And um, <clears throat> I hope that we're moving into an era where everybody is like safe and free to express themselves without um, moving into like a puritanical <laughs> uh, or like uh, humorless space. And, you know, I think sometimes we overcorrect as humans mm -hmm. and it'll be interesting to see where the dust settles. Yeah, uh, because right there's now, a balance at some point, maybe. Definitely. Um, but truly, I think production is, has changed so much. I mean, you can see it in, in the films that are being made. You can see that there's fewer background actors. You can... Um, I mean, I think that a lot of these adjustments are, are visible. Um, yeah, and it's hard to imagine a world actually where there was not intimacy coordinators because directors are not uh, often equipped to handle like the complexity of simulated sex. It, it's, you know, yeah, and you have a you have an you might have an artistic vision, but that doesn't need to be a very sort of yeah, it doesn't conclude also a very sensitive approach in working. So I think that's yeah, it's just it's something I I also find sort of dazzling. Oh, definitely. <laughs> it's I mean I yeah I hope that like the power structures are breaking down into a more egalitarian framework and structure. And I've certainly been on feminist sets like anti-racist feminist sets and it feels very different than a set where you know there's an asshole at the top and then everybody uh is similarly uh you know aggressive abusive hostile I mean that happens and it usually I mean I would say 10 times out of 10 it's like if there's a lower level person who's inappropriate or mean it's because at the very top there is it's systematic two. it's not mm -hmm. yeah it's yeah very complex <laughs> yeah hey thank you so much for your time oh my goodness thank you are you kidding this is just a terribly engaging conversation <laughs> no and I mean we know that yeah you're very busy but um yeah it was very nice that you just said yes um and uh yeah you're actually the first artist we are talking to um, really the exhibition period of Orlando so yes it was very yeah and I told my colleagues today we had a team meeting and I said yeah you're you're sort of a heroine to me so I was very nervous so thank you <laughs> thank you Nadine it's so sweet of you and thank you Lulu for coordinating and helping get me here yes and uh yeah all the best with the future endeavors and um yeah I'm absolutely sure we keep hearing from from you yeah i'm gonna come find you yes <laughs> one day soon i'm gonna make it over there exactly thank you so much 
Thanks, everyone. Catch you next time. Bye. Bye.